Welcome to Big Why Business Chats, brought to you by Ethical Hour, the go-to online community for business owners with a bigger purpose, who work for people, planet and profit. I'm your host, Sean Conway Wood, an ethical marketing strategist, sustainability writer and founder of Ethical Hour. In these conversations, I interview inspiring Big Why business founders to find out how they're making positive change happen and how you can too. Let's meet today's guest. Welcome to Ethical Hour's Big Why Business Chats, where we hear from inspiring business owners who are putting people and planet first. Today, I'm joined by voice talent, ethical marketer and author Jessica Lohman for a Big Why Business Chat in celebration of Endangered Species Day. We find out why animals and nature are at the heart of Jessica's Big Why. Hi, Jess. Hello. Thanks for yeah inviting me here. <laughs> so it's Endangered Species Day. That's what's bringing us together today. Why is saving species important to you, Jess? <sighs> because basically, if we continue driving species into extinction, we're going to drive our own species into extinction. And another thing, I just have a really, really deep connection with animals, spiritually, in the real world. Uh, I, I've always loved animals. As a kid, we rescued animals. I worked for um, vets during high school and college. And um, so it's this deep connection. I feel sometimes uh, that I can communicate better with, <laughs> with animals and with humans. But um, yeah, it's it, life without animals. Is, I just can't imagine. Um, it would just be so boring. And and the species that are endangered, they, our grandchildren won't ever see them. Not even in zoos. That it breaks my heart because it's just absolutely unnecessary. I completely share your passion for all things animals and nature. Um, but particularly animals and also a big part of my childhood and growing up and also going traveling. I know you spent some time in Africa seeing animals there. Um, I've done that as well and just seeing some of these amazing species and then the ones that you haven't had a chance to see, you know, just kind of hoping and doing everything you can to make sure that they're going to be there for us to go and see them and, and for other generations as well. Is there an animal that you haven't seen that you would really love to see? I'd love to see the polar bear. I'd, yeah. I'd love to see a bear in in real life, um, you know, from a distance. A wolf, definitely from a distance. A polar yeah. bear, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And the wolf. In fact, just over the weekend, um, somebody saw a, a sighting just right around the corner. I'm like, yes, oh, wow. <laughs> yes, they're coming back. Um, I mean, they have. That's in Germany. Back. You're in Germany, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in Germany. So I'm in, um, like, on the border of the Netherlands. So they were coming over from the east. And yeah, over the past, like, 10 years, they've just been sh- starting to show up more and more. Amazing. And, is it Yellowstone where they introduced the wolves again and then the whole ecosystem came back? Exactly. And it just shows you the importance of like one species. You know, if you lose that one species, what it does to the whole ecosystem. And we're in the sixth mass extinction. So we really yeah. need to be protecting nature and doing everything we can to restore that biodiversity. So that's amazing news that the wolves are coming back. And yeah. let's hope that you see one from a safe distance. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about the big why behind your work, Jess. What's your big why? Yeah, basically, so that I can help others, like in in my marketing business, I want to help social entrepreneurs who are helping save animals and and animal species with their ethical marketing strategy. Um, Because that's, you know, like you, that's my thing. I understand it, been doing it forever. And so, you know, using my, my expertise in helping them you know, either sell their products or sell their service, plus giving back to environmental causes and animal causes. Uh, Yeah, that makes my heart sing. Um, As an author, my, my why is to inspire children, um, like preteens, preteens, like eight to 12 year olds, uh, to respect nature, respect all animals, to inspire them to develop a deep ecological philosophy in that we are not the most important species on this planet. We are not above nature. We have to work with nature. 
And um, I also want to show kids that they do have the power. Yeah, they have the power and the passion to be able to create create change in this world, um, that they're not too young. And I mean, now's the time that, you know, with, with Greta Thunberg um, and all the young change creators out there right now, it's, it's easy actually to inspire them uh, without causing more anxiety. Um, and also what I'm trying to do is help the parents because <laughs> a lot of kids are coming home from school and saying, okay, mom, dad, I'm vegan. I'm hungry. What's for dinner? And the parents are like, I don't know what to do with this information. So I'm creating a course for the parents um, to help them with their overwhelm and to help them empower their conscious kids and to also help them deal with their children's anxiety. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a little bit like my why is, is, is education is also like practical marketing expertise. Um, and just, yeah, just trying to help change the psychology also with the ethical marketing thing that we don't market with manipulation because that causes excessive consumerism, which is, which enables uh, destruction over our planet and <laughs> driving our species into extinction, other species. So it's all connected. That's, I think that's why I was put here on this earth. And yeah, I've been called upon, uh, by my animal spirits and, and mother nature to do this work. So I'm like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. How did you find your big why, Jess? Did you have a light bulb moment or did it come to you over several years, several yeah. months? What was that journey like? It, it wasn't a light bulb moment. Um, I think it was always inside me. Um, like I said, the work with the animals at the vet, um, I did that throughout high school, college. That was the best, that was my best job. I mean, it was like, I, you know, I hardly made any money. I never had a break. You know, I was working on holidays and stuff, but um, I just never went back to that because I said, uh, I said to myself, okay, well, I can't become a vet because I'm too emotionally involved. And then, then I got into the record label business. But anyway, I, I just think it was always in there. And um, as soon as I left the corporate world in 2013, then I started um, offering voiceovers and uh, marketing strategy creation and implementation, uh, like copywriting stuff. And then I just realized who I wanted to work for. That was the first time that I was able to choose <laughs> who to actually work for. And that's when I realized, you know, who I wanted to help. And that's a social entrepreneur. So it was just kind of like a kind of like a rolling thing with with the book as far as like why I decided to write a book that actually happened after both my parents died. And um, like my mother died on the day that I arrived in South Africa for the trip of my life, uh, the adventure of my life. And that was pretty dramatic. That was not um, we it was unexpected. It was sort of known that something could happen, but you know, the surgery was a week before and we thought, okay, she survived the surgery, that's great. But yeah, a week later then, boom. Um, so that I first wanted to actually write a book about grieving in South Africa and how the animals helped me because she, she told me, do not come home, I don't want a funeral, stay in Africa and you know, meet with my husband and Barbara, my sister later. And that's exactly what we did with my, with my daughter as well. Then we met, you know, a couple of months later and um, yeah. So I wanted to write a book about grieving in Africa and with the photos that I took and how like seeing the, the first family of elephants, like how that just like, whoosh, that's, that's, that's like so emotional. And, you know, you just, felt it because elephants have a very nurturing motherly mm. um spirit and, and, and they're matriarchal oh. aren't they as a yes. society exactly the, the head of the family so yeah. that's very symbolic very and you know that was interesting that that was like the first 
animal that I saw. I mean, I saw a giraffe before, but very in the distance, but this mm. was like right in front of us. I mean, it was, it was in the dark too. So, um, and they're very quiet, but yeah. you know, you, you, just, you never different. forget that moment when you no. see them. I was, uh, it was the first animal I saw apart from monkeys. Um, yeah. And I just got to Zambia and we, I was, I took a taxi to Victoria Falls from the campsite I was staying at. And the taxi driver pulled over and he said, there's an elephant over there. And I couldn't see it. <laughs> like they, They're so big, but they just lend in and they're so they quiet, like you said. And then yeah. the emotion in that moment when you see them, they're incredible. That like You can't explain that to someone. It's, it's nothing compared to seeing them in a zoo yeah. or even a safari park or anything. Like when you see them in the wild and then to have had that emotional experience in your family and, and losing your mom and then seeing those family of elephants must have been just... Yeah, very intense experience. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I actually I actually wrote Ariana Huffington because when her mother died, that was also very um, emotional and very spiritual. Her mother knew she was going to die, but she didn't herself. Um, Ariana Huffington was the owner of the Huff Post, and now she has founded Thrive Global. And she wrote me back several hours later i had the blog post ready for the huff post she wrote me back several hours later because i also mentioned you know her mom's death and um and she was very kind i mean that was you know she's a famous person and she doesn't have time for me right that's what i was thinking but beautiful letter she was like today is the day that i stopped being being the ceo of the huff post and i want to invite you to be a contributor to Thrive Global as well. And she set that all up. Wow. And it was just so beautiful. Um, but um, but yeah, and then my dad died a, a, like a, a year later after a nine year horrible, horrible illness. And he went through so much stuff. And it was after, right after that, that I was like, okay, I, ha- I have to honor their, their existence somehow. What did they give me? that you know I can give to other people um that I can share and it was their their unconditional love for nature and animals we always went camping because we couldn't afford anything else um we were kind of not really (laughs) we weren't really dirt poor but (laughs) yeah it was a it was it was hard um so we went camping and I always loved that time. And yeah, so then I, I thought, okay, who can I inspire? And then I thought about children. So it was kind of like a, a development. You know, I don't know if I was getting downloads from the universe saying, you know, hey, you got to do this. But I just had these ideas and it, it just kept on forming into actually uh, what it became. Um, because just like in my protagonist in the in the book, I had to figure out who I wanted to talk about first because each book in the series is about a different animal rights issue and so the first one is about animal testing you know lab animals are so they're not existence they're not they don't like exist in people's minds really people don't think about them because everybody thinks okay well we can you know we need to test on animals in the medical field which is totally not true it's just big business it's a huge business and there's huge lobbies and all the people who work in the animal testing business, um, they have more of a say than the alternative methods, which are safer, cheaper. Yeah. And obviously more humane, but they're safer. They're more efficient. You know, you, you want to change a, a non-running system, but in this business, um, yeah, like many other industries. Um, yeah. A lot of similarities to big oil and the lobbying that they do. And exactly. you know, all of, like you said, all of these things are so interlinked and yeah. they're issues that we don't like to think about because they're difficult and, you know, painful. And, yeah. and also I think we think they're solved. Like I think a lot of people think that animal testing, apart from medical testing, like cosmetic testing is illegal, but there's so many loopholes oh, you know, no. in those laws. Um, and obviously that depends where in the world you are. But yeah. uh, even even in Europe where there are fairly good standards, mm. you know, there's still so many loopholes. Like if a brand is selling in China, then they, they can't be cruelty free because they have to test there by law and things. Well, actually that changed a couple of weeks ago in March. They mm. lifted that requirement in China. However, I still say the brands aren't just going to change like that yeah. right I mean now Lush could go in 
Yeah. You know, um, I don't know if they would want to, um, but they just they just lifted that requirement. Um, and they did that in 2014, too. But there were so many loopholes and it wasn't mm. really, you know, that was just on foreign brands, too. But it was still it wasn't quite right. But now, just a couple of weeks ago in March, they they said, OK, that's it. Um, but like I said, the brands aren't going to change right away and mm. they'll, they'll still do still do what they do but in the cosmetic industry it's at least easy um you still have to do your research because when a brand says we do not or we don't support animal testing that means yeah. absolutely nothing that's like, that's just greenwashing right and the thing with like endangered species a lot of people know that so many species are critically endangered so many plants as well um, which often get forgotten or not even thought about, you know, who cares about a plant? It's just mm -hmm. a weed, right? Um, but like you said, if we take out one, <laughs> one part of the, one piece of the puzzle, boom, it just makes the whole ecosystem just out of whack. So, you know, I think like in my third book, I want to write about uh, marine life because our oceans, our oceans and our forests, those are the two main things that I see that are in major trouble. And we need to rewild both of those Definitely. habitats and, and biodiversities. And just so crucial for so many things, but particularly yeah. for carbon, you know, both of them, yeah. the, the trees and the, the way the ocean stores carbon as well, like so, so important. Such a, a good series you've got planned. And obviously the first book is already out in the world. What's been the biggest challenge on, along this journey in terms of really getting into alignment with your big why and bringing that to life? <sighs> I guess it's as an author, like if I just said, okay, I'm, I'm going to not do the marketing or I'm not going to do the voiceovers. I'm just going to work on my author brand. It's like, Ooh, that's kind of, that's that, you know, I have actually thought about that because I just love to write. And, uh, but then I'm like, okay, first of all, there's a monetary thing. Right. Um, and I, I, I honestly, um, do not want to go to a publisher yet. I want to learn the industry first so that I know what I'm doing um, when I go to a publisher. And, you know, because there are these hybrid organizations, companies who, you know, I know what it costs or I know how much time it is to put a book on Amazon. That's nothing. That means nothing, you know, no time, you know, but they make it like a big thing. Um, so, yeah, pay a thousand dollars. No, I don't think so. You know, they're they're hybrid um, publishing companies like that. So basically I wanted to learn it and wanted to see how it, how it is, but I don't think I could rely on it like right away because of the financial things um, being an indie author. And also, you know, just because I love to write and I love to also help people um, in their brands. I'm like, I don't think I could get rid of that because even, you know, like, like you often say, we geek out about ethical marketing and I just like to write about that. So I write about it in Entrepreneur and I like to, um, you know, and on my blog and because it's all connected. Mm -hmm. So if I give up one thing, that's kind of like taking a, a species away from taking a part of me away. I've been doing this since 1991, um, the marketing part anyway. And, and also voiceovers. I was um, doing, uh, I was a DJ, college radio DJ. Um, so even before I started working in the marketing industry, I was, I was behind the mic. So it's like taking a part of me, um, and that would just make everything imbalanced, I think. But it's also hard to balance it all. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Libra, so I'm always like searching for that balance. Um, so it's hard to build up and maintain three businesses. Um, but yeah, the challenge is the balancing of my why. It's all aligned, however it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So you did our quiz and found yeah. out what type of big Y business founder you are. What was your result? It was the impact igniter. And that makes yeah. so much sense. I'm so glad that you got that result because I actually put you on our landing page when I built them of here are some impact igniters you should know about. <laughs> <laughs> but that makes so much sense with everything that you said, because impact igniters are all about inspiring others, helping other people bring their change to life, really kind of, you know, being that 
that spark of inspiration and impact igniters are very multi-passionate you know they have lots and lots of different causes that they care about they have maybe lots of different projects on the go at one time lots of different collaborations they're all about building that network of people but there is a common thread that runs through all of their work and that is their big why and obviously for you that is this real deep passion for animals and nature and inspiring that next generation just like your parents inspired you to really embrace that love of nature and protect it because when we love something we want to protect it don't we so if we can protect nature then we can all thrive and I think that's so so important if you're yearning to make a difference and you get goosebumps thinking about all the ways that your business could change lives and protect the planet then it's time to ask yourself how will your business change the world? Find out what kind of big Y business founder you are with our free quiz. You'll get a detailed profile exploring how to use your unique skills and superpowers to bring your vision for change to life. And you'll get tailored advice to help you overcome the challenges that you may face along the way. Head to ethicalhour.co.uk forward slash quiz to find out what type of big Y business founder you are today. What is the best thing, Jess, about bringing your big why to life and being able to do this work? It's when people actually come to me and say, you inspired me. Somehow, um, either through my book or through uh, writing or, you know, I had Manager News, which is a major news publication in Bulgaria. They translated some of my blog posts. And, you know, it's just, it's just the... Um, yeah, if I inspire, I also wrote that in my book, if I inspire just one person to think before they shop or think before they write that little piece of copy on their, you know, website, that's, that really helps. Of course, you know, you want to inspire as many people as possible, but it's just those little confirmations, I guess. You're um, such an impact igniter. <laughs> That's the exact thing an impact igniter would say. I love it. It's so it's so true because I think sometimes we think that we're too small to make a difference or that we can't influence people, you know, in this world of social media following and, you know, big numbers and all the rest of it. We kind of forget that actually just conversations, yeah. good books, you know, friendships, all of this is what inspires people and, and gets people talking and leads to change. And actually we can do that in so many different ways and I think that's what's so brilliant about the work that you're doing is you're doing it in so so many different ways and you're connecting with all these amazing people and making it happen you inspire me Jess so. oh thank you, <laughs> <laughs> well, you inspire me. <laughs> so what advice would you give to anyone that would want to embed some positive impact for animals into their business oh wow oh wow how long do we have um <laughs> Well, definitely work that in your giving back strategy. What I first did was, um, because you inspired me to, uh, to become a B1G1 member, and I truly love that. I was in with B1G1 for, uh, um, for a year, and I loved the giving back stories that you can create, um, that I was able to help different projects. Uh, and then I switched to 1% for the planet because... I wanted to do just a little bit more of the, the environment and the animal protection. And I wanted to work closely with one or two um, organizations. And I'm still, I, th I think I found it now. I think I found the or at least one organization that I really want to work with. But uh, yeah, it's so hard because, you know, you want to, pick the right one and you want to be able to work closely with them. I want to be able to, um, you know, volunteer there and really like work with them. Like I'm now doing with um, Doctors Against Animal Experiments so that I can feel that I'm really a part of the, the change. And so, yeah, so I want to be able to, you know, work with, work with an organization, one or two, who really is able to do this work. And then when we can travel again, then I can then I have a place to go. So I guess, um, you know, if somebody does want to go, want to use their talent 
to help save animals. You could do that in so many different ways. Collaboration, collaboration, that's that's the key. Uh, yeah, collaborate with those also working in the field, just collaboration, collaborate with those who have the same goal, with the organizations who have the same goal. I wish, what I wish for this world is that organizations and companies with the same goal that we would work together, that we have some kind of a unity because everybody's doing their own thing and we're not, having that much impact as if we could do it together and so that's that's my wish for the world collaboration (laughs) is so key and that leads me so nicely onto my final question um you've been a member of ethical hour for several years pretty much since i very first started you've been a a real key part of the community for so long jess so thank you Um, and why is being a community important Oh, oh, so many things. There are so many times where I'm like, I have a question or I need some, I need some market research or I, you know, I just, I just, um, you know, want some feedback and, you know, you could just bounce off ideas with, uh, with your community. Um, you know, I'm in, I'm in other, you know, Facebook groups and whatever too, but it's, it's like I get the most quality <laughs> answers from your group. Uh, I mean, I may not post a lot, but when I have posted, um, yeah, the, the quality answers definitely come because they are experts in their field. Um, and like Joe, she knows her materials. She knows her supply chain, right? Um, Joe Salter. And, um, you know, and, and Vicky knows tourism. And so, you know, everybody has their expertise and they're willing to share and they're willing to give and and also ask the questions and and then when we come together which has only happened once in in real life with the be the change award that was two years ago yeah two years ago yesterday exactly and you know then you just feel the magic um and it's like it's like you've known each other forever you know (laughs) it's like (laughs) You meet in person and like you said, it's like you've just known each other for years and just been the best of friends for years. And I think that's part of just sharing so much in common with with what our big whys are and, and the vision that we want for the world and, and the work that we're all doing and that we all understand how hard that is, but how important and how rewarding as well. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, Jess, it's been so lovely to talk to you. Thank you for coming and sharing your big why with us. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. You've been listening to Ethical Hour's Big Why Business Chats. To connect with inspiring Big Why business founders and find all the support, connection, opportunities and training that you need to make an income and an impact from your Big Why business, don't forget to join our community today. You'll find us at community.ethicalhour.com. Thank you for listening.